Welcome to the chapel. I'm Chuck Knapp, and I'm the interim dean of the Terry College of Business. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2014 Mason Public Leadership Lecture. This lecture is part of the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, a series that brings distinguished leaders to speak to our students here at the university. Representing the private and public sectors, our past speakers have both educated and inspired students at the university. Today's honored speaker, Secretary Robert E. Rubin, will be delivering remarks, and we're delighted, Mr. Secretary, to welcome you here to Athens. We especially appreciate your willingness to reschedule this event after it had to be postponed. I'm also pleased today to recognize the founder of this lecture, Terry College alum, Keith Mason, who will join us here on the stage following Secretary Rubin's remarks to offer thanks and ask the first question. Keith, where are you? Let's give Keith a round of applause. <laughs> Keith, you know we're deeply indebted to you for all you've done for the university and uh, your, your involvement with this campus over many, many years. And so we especially appreciate your support of this important series. At this time, I'd like to invite to the podium President Jerry Moorhead, the 22nd president of the University of Georgia, and a model of leadership himself. Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my Thanks and appreciation to Dean Knapp, our 20th university president, uh, for uh, putting this event together today. Good morning to all of you. I am particularly grateful to Secretary Rubin for honoring his prior commitment and agreeing to return to campus today when the weather is much better than uh, he would have found it a few months ago. I also want to express my thanks and appreciation to Keith Mason. We're indebted to Keith for so many reasons other than just this Mason lecture series. Keith has served the University of Georgia since 2007 as a University of Georgia Foundation trustee. He offers wise counsel uh, to senior administrators at this institution on a regular basis and certainly with the way he has led his life, this particular lecture uh, has even greater significance in my view because he is such a model of what we think of as a public servant. I want to thank him not only for establishing this lecture series, but more importantly for all the other contributions he makes to our institution on a daily basis. Today's speaker is one of those great public servants, a veteran of some of America's most prestigious financial houses. Former Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin began his career at Goldman Sachs in 1966. He served as Vice Chairman and Co-Chief Operating Officer from 1987 to, two, to 1990, and as Co-Senior Partner and Co-Chairman from 1990 to 1992. Before joining Goldman Sachs, he was a lawyer at the firm of Cleary, Gottlieb, Stein, and Hamilton from 1964 to 1966. In 1993, Secretary Rubin accepted the call to service on President Bill Clinton's economic team, first serving as assistant to the president for economic policy and subsequently as the first director of the National Economic Council. And then he served as the 70th Secretary of the Treasury from 1995 to 1999. From 1999 until 2009, Secretary Rubin has served as a member of the Board of Directors of Citigroup and as a senior advisor to the company. He is chairman of the Board of Local Initiative Support Corporation the United States' leading community development support organization. And in 2006, Secretary Rubin was one of the founders of the Hamilton Project, an economic policy project housed at the Brookings Institution that offers a strategic vision and innovative policy proposals 
on how to create a growing economy that benefits more and more Americans. Today, he also serves as co-chair of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the author recently of the New York Times best-selling book, In an Uncertain World, Tough Choices from Wall Street to Washington. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Rubin. Mr. President, thank you very much. I used to love to introduce President Clinton. I would get up and I would say, and now the President of the United States, <laughs> William Jefferson Clinton. So, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be delivering the Keith Mason lecture. I knew Keith when we served together in, in President Clinton's administration. And I, I think Keith symbolizes really one of the great strengths of our system, which is to say the shared experience across private and public sectors. Keith, as you know, has been enormously successful in the private sector and was also highly effective in our administration and has remained deeply committed to policy and to public good, both in Georgia and nationally. Let me also recognize a, a native daughter of Athens, <laughs> Karen Anderson, who's here with me. Karen is the managing director of the Hamilton Project, which the president mentioned, and she and I are colleagues in that respect. And also Karen's parents, the Emeritus Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Wyatt Anderson, and his wife, instructor in the Terry Business School, Margaret Anderson. Thank you again very much for having me with you. I've been asked to discuss two, two subjects with you all. I'll start with public service, both the critical role of government in our society and also the personal rewards of serving. And then I'll turn to the outlook for the U.S. economy for both the short term and the long term. I think the evidence has become clear that market-based economics is the most effective way of organizing economic activity. But equally, I think that a strong government is necessary for economic success to perform the many functions that markets, by their nature, will not perform adequately. There's a view, as you know, that, that markets and government are antithetical to each other. I think just the opposite. I think they complement each other, and I think you need both if you're going to have a successful economy. The debate about the role of government in our society, in our country, is as old as the republic itself. And that pendulum has swung back and forth. But it seems to me the key is to recognize the importance of both and to make sure that that pendulum doesn't swing too far in either direction. A Gallup survey was published last summer that was deeply, deeply troubling to me and should be deeply troubling to all of us. The survey reported that the American people have lost confidence in almost all of our institutions. For example, only 10 percent of the American people have confidence in Congress. I must say, when I saw that and I watched how Congress behaved, I sort of wondered who those 10 percent could possibly be, but in any event. <laughs> 23% in the media, 22% in business, banks, 26% in the presidency, 36% the Supreme Court, 34%, organized labor, 20%, and so it goes. The only institutions that were above 50% were the military at 75%, small business at 65%, and the police at 57%. I don't believe that our democracy can succeed if our people do not have confidence in its institutions. I will make the case later that the United States, at least very much in my view, is well positioned for long-term long economic success. But to realize that potential, we must have a government that effectively meets our policy challenges. And so within the context of this broad question of a loss of confidence, I'm going to focus on government and more specifically on the government dysfunction, the gridlock that underlies the loss of confidence in our political institutions. And I'll do so because effective government is so central to the future of our country. Let's start by considering the Congress. Uh, I had a very close relationship 
with Vice President Mondale, particularly in the period after he lost the presidential election. As you know, he'd been in the Senate for many, many years. At dinner about three or four months ago, he was talking with my wife and me about what it was like to be in Congress when he was there. And he said, look, when I was in the Senate, it was highly partisan, it was political, people yelled and screamed. But he said, at the end of the day, most of the members of Congress were committed to govern and committed to principled compromise. And he said, on most issues, not all issues, but most issues, we were able to move forward effectively. By the time President Clinton came into office, the system had deteriorated substantially. But even then, the administration and Congress were able to accomplish quite a bit on a bipartisan basis. Today, we have gridlock. A thoughtful senior member of the Senate, who I know pretty well, came by my office recently. And he said to me that even though some members of Congress really do try to engage with members of the other party, too many don't even make the effort to engage and simply repeat to each other their ideological and partisan views. Many factors have contributed to this breakdown. Uh, certainly the sense of community in Congress began to deteriorate decades ago when some members use their positions to abuse others. There's a lot of debate about how this process started, but what is clear is that once it did start, it ratcheted up in a vicious cycle. Another source of dysfunction, as all of you well know, is the homogeneity of House districts, and that's due partly to gerrymandering. But there was also a recent study that showed that independently of gerrymandering, that a lot of people simply like to live in neighborhoods of like-minded people, and that's increasing in our society. The result is that House members often reach toward the ends of the political spectrum that reflect the homogeneity of their districts, rather than reaching toward the middle. In addition, social media, although it has the potential for great good, acts as a conduit for ideology and partisanship. Campaign finance is out of control. Some well-intentioned reforms have backfired by overly reducing the ability of leadership to exercise their functions. Senate rules are abused so that virtually everything that comes before the Senate has to be passed by 60 votes, except for the budgetary measures that can be done under a, a special process requiring 51 votes. One consequence of all this is that in both chambers of Congress and in the public and political dialogue, the hollow, the center, has been hollowed out. And it really is, I think, not only troubling but almost tragic when you see some of the people you know, I know, who really have occupied the center, who've tried to make this system work, retire from Congress, retire from the Senate, because they've just given up. The adverse effect on confidence in our institutions is exacerbate, exacerbated by the feeling of many Americans that the political and economic system is simply not working for them anymore. Median real wages have been close to stagnant for several decades, with the exception of the second half of the 90s, when tight labor markets increased wages and incomes at all levels. And poverty has increased, as well as inequality. There are no easy answers to these income distribution issues, because in large measure, or at least in some, we could debate this, but in some fair measure at least, that income inequality, those distribution issues, are a function of the very forces that have been so central to economic growth. That is to say, technology and globalization. There's a new book just came out by a Frenchman named Piketty. And it's worth reading because he, I, I have not read it in my head, but I'm told it's worth reading. <laughs> I have no intention of reading. It's 570 pages, so I'm going to get some. No, I'm not going to read 570 pages. Ridiculous. But I'll get somebody to read it for me and tell me what it says. <laughs> I've actually done that already, so I know what's in there. And the arguments he makes really are around this question of what has caused this income inequality and is it, as I've just suggested, globalization and technology making a small portion of our population so much more productive and eliminating so many other jobs, or is there also a rent seeking, a, a, an inequality in, in the negotiating process? It's a really complicated and massively important question. And poverty, 
which was on the decrease when we left office is now rising again and is grounded in issues that are part of our history and we simply have not dealt with. Despite the current dismal prospects, I actually have a, a, a very affirmative view about the future of this country. I believe that the probabilities are high, that our system will restore its political functionality over time, though I would guess the process will be lengthy and messy. Our political system has a history of, of resilience. We have an extraordinarily dynamic society. It's one of our great comparative advantages in the global economy. There are many efforts underway now to try to improve the system, and some of those could grow and develop into something that really has a meaningful effect. And politics changes very, very rapidly in America. In addition, I continue to have the hope that ways will be found to take the social media, which really has become an echo chamber, as I mentioned a moment ago, for ideology, partisanship, take the social media and to use it effectively to engage the American people, not just inform the American people, but to engage the American people so they will insist that their leaders be committed to governing and to compromise. There are no guarantees and there are no quick fixes. But each of us can contribute. Whatever our, our political or, or philosoph philosophical views may be, by insisting that our elected leaders be committed to governing and be committed to the principle of engaging in principled compromise, because without principled compromise, our democratic political system cannot work. And you can do this in all, in all the many interactions, and many of your students, and you'll develop these interactions over time, hopefully. Interactions you have with our elected officials, you can do it with op-eds, you can do it with letters, you can do it with emails, you can do it if you make contributions to campaigns, you can do it if you work on campaigns. There are all kinds of ways to interact with our system. And in doing so, to insist, as I said a moment ago, that our leaders be committed to governing whatever their views may be. Beyond that, most of you are students. And I would strongly urge, and I base this on the experience of my life, and you can take this for what it's worth, but I would strongly urge that whatever you do with respect to your career, that at the same time you engage in political and civic activity. The country needs your involvement, civically and politically, and you'll find it makes life a lot more interesting. In my early days at Goldman Sachs, when I was a junior associate, I became involved in helping one of the senior partners raise money for an arts organization. And I didn't raise very much, but it got me involved. It got me engaged. Then I helped a mayoral candidate who didn't have a prayer of winning, but nevertheless, I helped a mayoral candidate meet young professionals. Nobody wanted to meet him, unfortunately, so that wasn't so easy to do, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was fun for me, and I learned a lot. I helped the finance director of the Democratic National Committee, Bob Strauss, who died recently, with his fundraising. And I joined the board of an organization that was looking for a few younger board members. And as you do, as, as you do something, things lead to things. Uh, a friend of mine who used to be uh, Senator Javits's executive assistant, administra administrative assistant, referred to the great mentioner. He said, if you want to get involved civically and politically, get involved with the great mentioner. And I said, well, Judd, what's the great mentioner? And he said, the great mentioner is you get involved in one thing, then people start to mention your name, you get the opportunity to get involved in other things, and it can build on itself. And I, I think that's kind of true, and so does Keith's done. I mean, it's just sort of the way life works. To take this further, hopefully some of you will decide to spend at least part of your career, and maybe your whole career, in public service. You'll be contributing to the desperate need we have for an effective government, and, you're going to, and you will find the experience extraordinarily rewarding personally. After the president-elect asked me to become head of the National Economic Council during the transition before his first term, I mentioned this to, uh, and it hadn't been public yet, I mentioned this to uh, one of America's best known former cabinet members, somebody whose name all of you would recognize. And he said that uh, what I would do in government is I would work down my, my, my intellectual capital because I would never have time to learn anything more. Instead, my time in government, I found, was a steep learning curve from beginning to end in which I learned about government, politics, the media, how our system works, the interaction between politics, media, and communications, and, and so much else. And contrary to the assertions of some, I also found that I was working with people who were as capable and as committed to what they were doing as any of the people that I had worked with in the private sector. Moreover, 
And in that respect, but let me also let me add one other thought just occurred to me. It really was a remarkable group of people I had the opportunity to work with. And too often, I think, there is a tendency on the part of some to denigrate those in public service. That does an enormous disservice to them, but also a tremendous disservice to our political system. I believe that we should honor those in public service. Finally, in public life, there is a special sense of mission, a special sense of purpose. I had the opportunity to work on issues which affected vast numbers of people in this country and in some cases even abroad. With that, let me turn to the outlook for the U.S. economy, which as I've indicated already is very much affected by public policy and by the effectiveness of our political system. Let me start by saying that from my perspective as an investor, which I am, and from my perspective as having remained very active or at least remained active in the, in the public policy dialogue, I think this is a time of extraordinary complexity and uncertainty for our country. In fact, I think for the global economy as well, though that's not my topic of today, for both the short term and the long term. Looking at the shorter term, a lot of analysts have now increased their estimates for the last three quarters of this year. The first quarter is probably weak, but for the last three quarters of this year to 3% or above. That's partly due to the uh, reduction in fiscal drag, which you're all familiar with, and then partly because there's a feeling that the, the first quarter suffered from harsh weather. And that may turn out to be the best judgment about what this last three quarters will be like, something in the neighborhood of 3%, maybe even a bit better. But if you look at the four components of demand in any economy, consumption, net exports, government and investment, residential and business, the numbers of the past few quarters and the conditions of those quarters, if you extend them out, would not produce that projected rate in the neighborhood of 3%, but probably would lead you to something more toward 2.5%. In either case, whether you get the slightly higher or the slightly lower number, the much more important point is that any of these projections are a slow recovery by historical standards. The question is, with respect to the more positive of these two prospects, and even more importantly, the question is, with respect to trying to break out of, breaking out of the slow recovery, where will the impetus come from? And let me illustrate the point by looking at consumption. Consumption, as you know, is the largest component of GDP by far, about 70 percent. It is driven predominantly by labor income. There was a lot of celebrating when job increase, when numbers were, were announced with respect to job increases in the neighborhood of 190,000 jobs per month. If you assume a, a rate of job increase of 200,000 a month, which is more than we've had on average last year by a lot, and it's more than we've had on average this year by a lot, that still only increases jobs by 1.7% a year. If you then factor in some increase in real earnings, but it's been relatively slow, and some increase in hours worked, but that's also been relatively slow, you basically have labor income increasing at a relatively, excuse me, a relatively moderate rate, certainly not a rate sufficient to support the more affirmative forecast and, and most certainly not at a rate sufficient to break us out of the slow recovery. There could be a wealth effect, as those of you who have focused on economics know, from the very large increases in the stock market prices and from housing price increases, but all economic analysis I've seen suggests that, that would be a very small number. The result of all this is that most analysts, when they talk about better growth or when they look to the possibility of, of actually breaking out of our slow recovery, focus on a revival of business investment. And that, in turn, is based on the idea of improving financial conditions. However, if you look at business investment, it was basically been pretty sluggish, a little bit better at the end of last year, but basically a little bit sluggish. And at least from my perspective, more to the point, I see a lot of people involved in running businesses. I still have a, a part-time job, uh, part-time unemployed, uh, part-time employed. <laughs> and uh, I work with an investment banking boutique to some extent. And I see a lot of people who run big companies. 
and they're not talking about, they have enormous amounts of cash, they have strong balance sheets, but they're not talking about investing for the most part. They're not buying back their stock or building up cash and, and simply increasing the, the financial strength of their balance sheets. I hosted a dinner, oh, a couple of months ago maybe, for 10 members of boards of some of America's largest companies. And every single one of them said that they expected that business investment would remain slow, and every single one of them said they expected that growth would be slow in 2014. I do think that policy could make a real difference, and that policy could provide the impetus that broke us out of our slow recovery. For example, if we had a well-constructed fiscal program, that program could generate jobs and growth now, and it could meet the long-term imperative for a sound fiscal regime. The specifics of such a program are a long discussion, but the basic idea is to enact fiscal discipline now, but defer implementation for a limited period of time to give the recovery room to get traction. And specifically, what this could do is right now, you could rescind the sequester fully, and you could put in place a reasonable stimulus in the context of fiscal discipline, and that would create demand. And secondly, I believe that if you put in place fiscal discipline, that could have a serious boost, a significant boost to business confidence. I think business confidence is very strongly adversely affected by this concern that our fiscal conditions create about what future policy will be like, and also for heightened concern about the dysfunctionality of our government. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of, there are a goodly number of other areas in which action by Congress and the administration could, I think, both create a substantive beneficial effect and improve confidence. Uh, immigration reform, K through 12 education, trade, and much else. All of this is complex substantively. All of it is doable substantively. And the problem is political gridlock. Let me now turn to a few comments on an enormously complicated and controversial measure that I believe could have major effect on economic conditions, perhaps this year, and in my judgment, at least quite likely, sometime over the years to come. And that is the unconventional monetary policy referred to as quantitative easing three, or QE3. The first round of quantitative easing, as you know, was called QE1, and I, I think it was necessary because we were on the verge of an abyss. We were on the verge of a financial and economic collapse, and I think QE1 played a very real role in fending that off. The warrant, the, the, justific the, the, the explanation for QE3 is that we have high unemployment, which is true, and that other policies are not available because of the dysfunctionality of our political system, and we have to do something. I don't think there's any question but that our weak labor markets are immense, a matter of immense social and, social and economic concern. But I think the right criterion is not that we don't have anything else we can do, but rather what are the costs and what are the benefits. And I think that there has been far too little focus rigorous focus on a cost-benefit analysis with respect to QE3. There are different views about the benefits of QE3, but I would say on the whole, most economists think the benefits have probably been very limited. And I at least think that the risks are both real and serious. QE3, even if it, QE3, which as you know, is, is the, the Federal Reserve Board buying these vast quantities of treasury bonds and, and mortgage-backed securities in the markets, so that they've now increased the balance sheet from what had been under $1 trillion on the balance sheet of the Fed prior to the crisis to $4 trillion today. QE3 may or may not have had much of an effect on Treasury bond prices. I kind of think it probably hasn't, but you could debate that. But what it has done is it's created a comfort in the markets that the Fed is standing behind the bond market. And I think that's had two effects. Number one, I think it's taken pressure off of our political leaders to act. That, as you know, is called moral hazard. And secondly, I think it has probably also heightened the tendency of investors at a time of low yields to reach for yield 
going up the risk curve, and that in turn creates a higher probability of excesses and then destabilization. Having said all that, the most significant risk of all is not what I've already mentioned, but rather unwinding the vast increases in the Fed's balance sheet and the commensurately vast increases in liquidity that have been created by the Fed. I've been around monetary policy for a long, long time, and monetary policy decisions always involve a lot of uncertainty. But these uncertainties are greatly heightened by the balance sheet increase I mentioned a moment ago, from $1 trillion before the crisis to $4 trillion today. And I think that when the Fed begins to tighten, as inevitably they presumably will at some point, though that may be way off in time, and in managing the tightening, this, these uncharted waters, navigating these uncharted waters, considerably increases the risks that either when they tighten, they push us into a downturn, or at least exert strong downward pressure on the economy, or if they wait too long to tighten because of the fear of a downturn, that this stimulates and then creates significant and increasing inflation. I just want to make one technical point, and you can sort of disregard this if you want, but I want to do it just to complete the picture. There are people who, who will say the Fed has built up this big balance sheet, it's $4 trillion. When they want to tighten, they have to sell the bonds they bought in order to reduce liquidity. And, and yeah, that could create a risk, but they can avoid that. There are other ways of dealing with that liquidity. Because basically what's happened is the banks have gotten the liquidity, and they haven't used it to lend, but what they've done is they put it on, excuse me, they've put it on deposit as reserves, excess reserves. And there are a lot of ways the Fed could try to deal with this without selling bonds, but rather various actions they could take with respect to these excess reserves. And a lot of people say, well, that will, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people. There are analysts who say that that will avoid the risks I've just described. My view is that there is no, there are no magic wands. And while it's true, there are other ways to deal with this problem. I think all of those other ways of dealing with this problem have their own dynamics, and that when you get to the end of the day, you're still faced with the same problem of unwinding in uncharted waters, and that that navigating in uncharted waters creates a, I think, meaningfully heightened risk that the Fed's decisions at some point will either exercise downward pressure on our economy, or if they wait too long, lead to inflation. I live on Wall Street in a sense, I mean, it's kind of good, fair bit of my life. And for the most part, people, analysts aren't really focused on this risk. And the ones that are focused on it, for the most part, feel the odds are high that the Fed will work their way through this without the untoward effects that I just described. And that may well turn out, and those benign views may well turn out to be right. My own view is, is to have a considerably greater concern about the effects this could have over time, though the timing is certainly unpredictable. Let me wind up by turning to the longer term. I'd rather invest in the United States than any other major economy for the long term. And I spent a lot of my adult life around the various pieces of the global economy. We have great strengths, a dynamic and entrepreneurial culture, the rule of law, flexible labor and capital markets, vast natural resources. And John Deutsch, who'd been, as you know, director of the CIA, wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs saying that the, 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 the recovery through fracking has created a revolutionary change in global energy conditions in our favor. Uh, demographics that are favorable relative to Europe and China. And a substantial improvement in our competitive cost position with respect to manufacturing because of labor-saving technology and lower energy costs. So I believe that we are very well positioned for the long term. However, and this is the key, to realize that potential, we must establish sound long-term uh, fiscal conditions. We must have robust public investment in infrastructure, basic research, and so much else. And we must have reform in areas that are key to the economy, uh, energy, K through 12 education, immigration, uh, I would say regulation with respect to more effectively 
imposing cost benefit while at the same time providing strong protection and much else. I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, all of these policy challenges are complex. But if you had willing negotiators, even if they had very different views, but willing negotiators who were prepared to govern and prepared to engage in the principled compromise, which as I said earlier, is absolutely essential if our democracy is going to work, you could move forward in all of these areas effectively and soundly. The problem is gridlock that is grounded in political and ideological inflexibility. I've already expressed my view that I, I really do believe, and I think with good reasons, that we will recover from this, that in time we will once again have a level of functionality necessary to meet our, our challenges. But there are no guarantees, and there is a great deal to do. Let me conclude that uh, I believe deeply in the special attributes that make America, America. All of us can help in what is the essential, fundamental, and ultimate challenge of our future, that is to say, restoring effective government. By educating ourselves about the nation's policy challenges, and then whatever our views may be, conservative, liberal, or whatever it may be, insisting that our elected leaders commit to govern and insisting that they engage in principled compromise. Thomas Jefferson said, and this is a paraphrase, Thomas Jefferson said, that in a democracy, elected officials will make the difficult decisions that are necessary if they feel that they are being held accountable by an informed electorate. And I think what we each have the responsibility to do is to be that informed, and I would add, actively engaged electorate. And if we do that, then all of us together can make an enormous difference with respect to the functionality of our political system and the future of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know that your remarks have generated a lot of questions uh, for our Q&A period, but what I'd like to do is start by asking Keith Mason to come up to the stage and express his thanks for your appearing and start with the first question. Keith. Thank you, Dean Knapp. Thank you, Secretary Rubin, for being here. I'm very honored by your presence. Thanks to uh, President Moorhead and all the uh, senior administrators here at the University of Georgia. And mo most importantly, thanks to all of you students who have uh, come here today to uh, learn uh, the, the great wisdom that the Secretary has had to offer here today. Uh, the, the first question I have for you, Mr. Secretary, is you, you touched upon um, the in income inequality issue that has been uh, prominent in public debate here recently. And you know we are among a lot of college students that earn minimum wage. Uh, we have also uh, uh, learned a lot about the earned income tax credit. You and, and your service uh, in the Clinton administration was very instrumental in expanding the, the earned income tax credit. Can you give us your philosophy on how to address the income inequality issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis the minimum wage as well as the earned income tax credit? Look, I think it's one of the great challenges that we face. You know, I, I frame this a little differently to myself when I think about it, and it, it's, I think, the way President Clinton framed it when he was in office. We have had vastly increased inequality, and that clearly has all sorts of adverse social and economic ramifications. But I, I think, at least for me, uh, a somewhat better way of thinking about this is how to, and this is what President Clinton used to talk about for the whole eight years he was there, how do we increase the earnings of middle-income and lower-income Americans. So it isn't just a question of trying to even out some, but really it's trying to increase incomes on an ongoing basis for working Americans. And I think that, I think the lessons of the 90s when we really were successful in doing that, but the lessons of other periods as well, 
are that growth is necessary, both because you want to have a bigger pie to split, but also because you want to have tight labor markets, because tight labor markets do have an upward pressure on wages. But growth is not sufficient. And what we tried to do is we tried to, and then I'll get to your two points, Keith. We tried to design growth policies that we also thought would result in a broad-based sharing in the benefits of growth. And Keith just mentioned two examples. Uh, we did increase the minimum wage, and it should, my judgment, at least should be increased substantially now. It hasn't been increased in a long time, and it's much lower than it should be, in my opinion. There have been tons of studies of, of, the, of the minimum wage, because this is controversial. And I, I think almost all of the, the studies that are what I'd call serious academic studies, no matter where they're, what sort of point in the spectrum they're done from, the political spectrum, indicate that substantial increases from where we are today would probably have minimal, if any, effect on jobs. I mean, at some point you would have you know, an effect, but the negative impact on jobs from a substantial increase would be, would be minimal. And then there's the earned income tax credit. And I don't know how many of you all are familiar with this. I actually was not before I came to Washington. It was President Reagan's favorite social program, and he was right, because the earned income tax credit is a refundable tax credit. That is to say, if you have an income below a certain level, it's not only you don't pay taxes because you're below the level at which one pays ta uh, income taxes, I'm talking about. You obviously pay uh, Social Security, Medicare taxes. You not only don't pay income taxes, but you actually get a refundable tax credit. You actually receive uh, disbursement from the federal government. And so it is an encouragement for people to work rather than not work. And it provides low-wage working people with additional income that they then can use to support their families and improve education, improve health care, and so much else, which in turn contributes to their productivity and, and con contributes to the productivity of our society. And I'll wind up with this. There's this debate. You often hear this debate, should we have deficit reduction or should we have public investment? In 1993, when President Clinton put in place his deficit reduction program, we vastly increased the earned income tax credit. You can do both at the same time. It's a question of having priorities. We also increased revenues by increasing taxes on the top 1.2 percent of Americans. Buddy Darden here someplace? He was, yeah. Buddy had the courage to vote for that bill, and it was not a universally popular vote. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was critical because we were, I think, we won by one vote in the House, didn't we, Karen? I think something like that. So Buddy really responsible for what I think was just, because without any one vote, we wouldn't have passed, it was tremendous good for our country. Well, I don't want to get involved in sort of intra-family problems, but <laughs> that doesn't seem to me an appropriate thing to do. But, but I think it's a little bit different because these, these high-frequency trading things can move at roughly the speed of light. I don't know how fast your brother is, but, <laughs> but these things really move. You know, I don't know enough about it to have a view. Clearly, I shouldn't say clearly, there's clearly an issue here that needs to be looked at and very, very carefully. And based on a little bit I've read about it, I actually didn't know much about this until all this. Based on all that I've read about it, I think that the real problem is that it may well be that a lot of the markets that you see and you think you're going to trade against then turn out not to be real, and that's a real problem. Now, how much difference does it make to somebody like me, who I rarely buy or sell anything, and if I do, if the marginal cost of it's increased by a little bit or not a little bit, I don't know, does it really matter? Probably not, but I think in a larger sense it matters a lot because I think confidence in the credibility of American markets has really been an important factor for our, our markets and for our economy. And so if there is a real problem, and my instinct from reading all this is there is a real problem, then I think you've got a real regulatory issue that needs to be dealt with.
good, interesting question. Let me just, uh, I have a fundamental belief, and I, I describe it, or I discuss it really at length in my book, which, by the way, is available in paperback for those who are interested. <laughs> and, and there's no limit on the number you can buy. There's not a quota. I, I have believed, when I was in college, I took my sophomore year of college, I took a course in philosophy from a man named Raphael Demos. I've never forgot him. And he got up in the front of the lecture hall. He, well, you don't have one here, but he took the waste wastebasket. He turned, little, little Greek, older Greek man. He took his wastebasket. He turned it upside down. He put his lecture notes on top of the wastebasket. And I was enthralled. And he took us through philosophy, history of philosophical thought over the course of a year. I think we began with the Greek. Yeah, I don't think we went before. I think we began with the, 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 the Greek philosophers. And the conclusion I reached, at least, is there is no provable certainty. And that certainly is the view of, as it turns out, <laughs> I didn't know at the time, that is the view of modern science. There is no provable certainty. So if there's no provable certainty, then everything is a matter of probabilities. And I think that in everything I have ever done, I have never seen a single issue which didn't seem to me complicated. And I never saw a single issue that seemed to me to have an absolute answer. And I've never seen a single issue that it seemed to me didn't need to be weighed and balanced. And I've seen so many people get in trouble in the other ways. I ran all the trading operations at Goldman Sachs at one time. Well, I didn't run them. I had responsibility for them. And I remember traders would come to me sometimes and say, this is a sure thing. And I would say, there are no sure things. And, oh, yeah, this is a sure thing. Well, OK, it's a sure thing. But we're going to limit what we do just on the off chance that it's not a sure thing. And sometimes these things would blow up. I had a friend who ran a similar up when I was quite a bit younger. And I was running all the arbitrage stuff. And, I had a friend running an arbitrage operation at another big firm, and he called me one day and said the same thing. He said, we have a sure thing here. Let's really do this. And I said, you know, I don't, sure thing, I, don't, I think we should take a big position. I agree with you. But I don't think there is such a thing as a sure thing. He said, oh, yeah, this is it. So I did take a big position. It did blow up. We lost a lot of money, and the senior partner yelled at me. He took an enormous position and got fired. And I think there's a lesson in that. There are no sure things. When we went to President Clinton, and Larry Summers and I went to President Clinton in January of 1995, we said, and the same thing is true in policy. We said, Mr. President, um, Mexico is facing a, a crisis of, of, of immense, uh, immensely potential damage. And we think we should, we should get engaged. We think we, sh we should uh, provide support to Mexico along with the IMF. But we will tell you, Mr. President, that there are no guarantees. We think the probabilities are this will work, but there's a, a significant chance that it won't work. And you'll remember January of 95, in 90, November of 94, the President got killed in the elections. So, and the politics of this were terrible. We said to him that there was a recent poll that showed that 80% of the American people were opposed to our getting engaged. And he talked with us for a little while and he said, look, I get it. You're telling me that there's nothing sure about this. You think the odds are in our favor. You've done a lot of work on it. I accept that notion and I'm prepared to go ahead and do what we ought to do even though I know there's a lot of risk. Well, a lot of risk in the sense that A, that it could, it could not work and if it didn't work, the politics could be terrible. So I think the answer to your question is that everything you face and everything you ever will face, if it's significant, is complex. You ought to recognize the complexity and then recognize it's a matter of probabilities. And once you recognize it's a matter of probabilities, that then should cause you, I think, to want to learn ever more about it in the time that you have. But you can't be stymied. Then at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. You know, the black swans thing, uh, a fellow cabinet member of mine, used to, I used to drive her crazy because she would say, what are we going to do about this? And I would say, well, you know, not every question has an answer. And my colleague would say, of course, every question has an answer. And I would say, OK, maybe, but I don't know what that answer is. So I don't think every question does have an answer. But we'll do the best we can. And that's all you can ever do. And uh, sometimes the uncertainties are so enormous that you're better off leaving an issue alone if you can. But very often, the, those very issues are the ones you can't avoid. And very often, and Mexico is a good example of it. All the choices are lousy. And so you've got to make the least, least lousy choice. And that's decision making. I think the repeal itself was relatively inconsequential. If you look back at the history, starting in the late 80s, 87, I think, but don't hold me to that, the Fed started to reinterpret Glass-Steagall. So by the time it got rescinded, which was 2000, I think early 2000, all of the, the, the limitations or restrictions on the major banks 
had been eliminated by Fed interpretation, except for the restriction on insurance underwriting, which was irrelevant. So I don't think it really had an effect on what banks did. I think it did make it administratively easier to function across multiple areas. But the, the limits, the, the, the Citigroup merged, the city, um, let's see, it was Citigroup and Travelers merged. And they could have done that merger under Glass-Steagall. The only thing they would have had to do is to divest themselves of insurance underwriting. You know, it is interesting, by the way, when you had the crisis, which was sort of was eight years later, the companies that first really got in serious trouble went out of business, Lehman, Bear Stearns, Merrill Wood have except it was acquired, AIG, none of them were subject to Glass-Steagall. And the two activities that the banks conducted that were at the heart of the bank's issues were the collateralized debt obligations, which were mortgage extension, and LBOs, which were corporate lending, and that could have been done even on the original Glass-Steagall. But in any event, by the time it was rescinded, it was, as I say, for de facto purposes, it had been predominantly rescinded anyway. So I think, I think it was relatively inconsequential in terms of its future effects. I think the question, I think the, the more important question now is, you, you got to 2007, 2008, and we had the worst crisis, financial crisis in history, that, well, in 80 years, and clearly what had happened is that the downside risk of the markets and of our financial system was far greater than virtually anybody saw. I mean, I lived with tail risks all my life and tried to figure out how to manage them. And I certainly didn't see that, the potential for that kind of, I thought there were excesses, but not, not the potential for a mega crisis. I saw Ben Bernanke was, quote, was quoted in the release transcripts saying he thought that the downturn that was occurring was a garden variety cyclical downturn. There was virtually no one who saw what this was gonna be, but once it happened, it seemed to me the absolute imperative was for reform. And I think for the most part, the reform we've done is probably sensible. Uh, there's some parts of it I don't think, I, I think there are real questions about. But, but this question, which in a sense is the most important question, and well, I shouldn't say the most important. I think consumer protection agency was a good idea. As I say in my book, way before the crisis, I think the derivatives need, need to be dealt with, so I think that was good. Um, too big to fail problem, which is probably many of you know, is a very controversial issue. That, I think we still have not found a solution to. You, you can put in resolution mechanisms, I don't know, this may get more technical than you want to be, but you can put in resolution mechanisms that solve a problem for a particular institution if it gets in trouble. But if we have systemic trouble, I don't think the resolution mechanisms can be will be responsive to that problem, and I think we'll once again be in a position where we're going to need uh, federal support if we're going to avoid going over an abyss. Um, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned one of the risks in, in your remarks was uh, the current state of K-12 education in the country, and I'd like you just to elaborate on where you see that and where you see it going. <laughs> You're way out beyond my competence, but the thing that I, and so I'm, I'm not going to give much of a specific answer, I really don't know very much, is this big argument now about core, core curricula, and should we have core curricula, shouldn't we have core curricula? I, I don't know the foggiest notion, because I don't know enough about it. But what does strike me is that unfortunately, an awful lot of this debate seems to be affected by not the merits of the issues, but rather where you stand in the debate. And I don't say this is critical of anybody, but there are people who have very, oh, I'd say quasi-ideological views about K through 12 education. There are also people who have strong interests of one sort or another. Uh, you have municipal administrators, you have labor unions, you have politicians, you have all sorts of others. And I think it comes back to a little bit of what I said before I think there's a probably a bro pretty broadly held view that our K through 12 system is far from what it needs to be. And I think we have to get to a point where these different disagreeing parties can come together and agree on moving forward. And in this case, I think moving forward is a rather interesting notion because in a federal system, you can move forward in one way in one area and one way in another, area, another way in another area. And you can really do in an effect or almost test cases of different approaches to the K through 12 reform. And then if people, and then if those involved are open-minded and look at the merits rather than the specific perspectives for which they come at the issues, I think there's a, a real chance we could, we could move forward. But it's gonna take, once again, the, the willingness to govern, the willingness to engage in principled compromise, and the willingness to have what in effect is an, an effective governing system, albeit here, one that involves mostly states and, and localities, states and cities, and, and the various 
interests that are involved in, in that issue. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your remarks and thank you for your service to our country. Let's give our special thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.